report. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back. I hope you all have a good uh, little break. The only bad thing about the break is not long enough, right? <laughs> but we'll take it. It's better than nothing. And uh, it was good for me. A little busy because um, I'm at a parish also, just in residence. But the pastor is away on vacation now. So I got double duty between the parish and the university. But uh, happy to be back anyway and uh, eager to get started with the courses for this new semester for the spring. It's amazing that um, basically 25% uh, of the program is over already. This is four semesters. <laughs> you, we all just finished one semester. So it's moving quickly. All right. Always beginning with a little prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, once again, we come before your presence in the name of your Son, Jesus. We ask that you send your Holy Spirit to illumine our hearts and minds, as you did on the baptism of your Son, as we will celebrate tomorrow the solemnity of the baptism of the Lord, precisely to close the Christmas season, the time that we celebrate your incarnation, your first half of the mystery of faith, of your passage through earth, as you become one like us. In that mystery of the incarnation, we see also our human nature exalted and glorified in anticipation. As St. Augustine has said, you have become human so that we may be divinized and share eternal life with you. We thank you for your many blessings and especially for the gift of your son, Jesus. We pray for this new semester, all the teaching and learning that uh, will occur here at St. Thomas University and throughout the world. That it may be a new year where we get closer to peace on earth, the peace that only your son Jesus can give us. We ask this as we ask all things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Can you imagine? Oh, another one this morning, really? Six, six, six again. Mm -hmm. Wow, the first one was 6.4 or something like that. It's just incredible. You know, but they are actually at a fault line. It's, um, it's very intriguing, but very different from us. We're only a few hundred miles away, but the big difference is precisely what is known as the Puerto Rico Trench, which is the lowest depth of the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's see. Yes, what happens is that uh, they are on this fault line. I guess this is also more illustrative. It's going to lose resolution. But uh, in contrast to us, that we are on the tailing end of the continental shelf of the North Atlantic plate. Remember we talked about plate tectonics uh, briefly, we'll cover it more in detail in the summer. But uh, there is a North Atlantic plate which covers uh, Mesoamerica also, and we're on the tailing edge of it, and this plate is moving uh, westward, all right? So we're on the tail, uh, the tail end. That's why we have a fairly extensive uh, platform um, continental shelf here. But in contrast to that, Puerto Rico and the beginning with the Lesser Antilles here, there is uh, a rub between plates there, and there's a trench that is the deepest part of the Atlantic Ocean, <laughs> just like the Marianas Trench on the Pacific, which is twice as deep, uh, and the Atlantic being twice as large also as the, uh, the Pacific being twice as large. But that fault is actually active, and that's also what may have caused that, that earthquake in Haiti uh, a few years ago that had thousands of 
people die, unfortunately, because it also caused landslides and mudslides because of deforestation that had happened in, uh, that has happened in, in uh, Haiti. Anyway, that whole area is actually active with uh, uh, earthquakes, even though they're, they're rare, but uh, it's there. All right. Let's uh, go back here. So today we're going to this uh, course, actually this semester, we have two courses. We have the bioethics of the beginning of life and bioethics of the end of life, right? End of human life. And even though on the schedule, their schedule both for 16 weeks, uh, but uh, one is in the morning, the other one is in the afternoon, on the official schedule. For our purpose, what we'll do is half, we'll devote half of the semester to the beginning of life and half the semester at the end of life for the longer lectures that we do in the three hour lecture and so. Uh, so we we'll only have to come in the morning and that's the standard, all right? Even though the books is there for the afternoon. Don't pay attention to that schedule, please. <laughs> All right. All right, also, hmm, let's see. To put it in context, as we look at the uh, big picture here. Oh, I had it in the, uh, oh, I had a little slide here, but I didn't save it. <laughs> it's active on my desktop in my office. Let me do this for a moment, uh, just to put it in context. Uh, from last semester and the program, right? So we're doing essentially a theological anthropology, which is a Judea, Judeo-Christian, Theological anthropology. So, Genetically and ontogenic. It's a little bigger. So again. This big long word, Judeo-Christian theological anthropology. Anthropos, you know by now that anthropos is a reference to the human, right? And uh, logos from the Greek is uh, word or study. So the study of the human, a vision of the human person, right? A vision of the human person. That is theological, meaning that it includes God in the picture, okay? and that it is according to our Judeo-Christian tradition. So it's going to be based on scripture, but also tradition. The two pillars of um, our faith, which are um, the word of God and the, the putting into action of that word of God throughout the centuries and the millennia with the teachings of the church, okay? so. This Judeo-Christian theological anthropology allows us to highlight precisely the dignity and the sanctity of human life as God's image. And in fact, we have a confirmation of that. That's uh, why we highlight uh, the, uh, the Christmas season because of the incarnation of God. So we can say that beyond being God's image, we're actually the image of Christ. That's why we call Christ the, the new Adam, because he's really the first human theologically, even though chronologically, the first human was anywhere from 
uh, two, two million to 200,000 years before the time of Christ, but theologically he is the first human because he restores our humanity to the original plan of God. And I want you to keep that little phrase uh, in mind as we go through the courses, through the various courses, and especially in the summer, in the environmental course, when we look at human population and population growth and density, what is, plan, what is God's plan? Okay, and what has been God's plan? We can intuit and we can discern God's plan by using right reason, by, by reflecting a little bit. Mm -hmm. And how at times we have deviated as a humanity from God's plan with grave consequences, unfortunately. But uh, back to then to this uh, theological anthropology, we're looking for a very deep and profound vision of the human person, um, somewhat uh, parallel to what uh, St. John Paul II did with the theology of the body, which is 129 talks on human sexuality because we're sexual beings. Notice that in Genesis 1, the first chapter of Genesis, together with, in the same verse, the first, uh, those last two verses there of chapter one, when uh, God says, let us make man human in our image and likely and likeness, male and female, let us create them. So our sexuality is associated with our uh, imaging God one way or another, okay, in a very mysterious way. At any rate, um, we, the first uh, course was doing this uh, phylogenetics, in other words, looking at our possible origins as a species, as a whole group, right? And trying to be respectful both to our biblical tradition and at the same time to the evidence of science, to the evidence of nature through the scientific method, the rigor of the facts, as we see them, right? And that's uh, why we went into the anthropology that we did that semester, including the principles of evolution that are pretty solid and have been confirmed time and again, but that as long as we don't interpret the Bible literally in a fundamentalistic way, we can, at least in my mind, we can, uh, combine or um, uh, how can I put it, uh, uh, we can do justice both to the biblical narrative of creation of the human and all creation, and at the same time to the scientific fact of the fossil record and so forth, and especially the phylogenetic tree of uh, percentage homologies, right? All right, so let me stop there for a moment. If you have any questions or comments, or is it bringing back memories uh, from uh, last semester? <laughs> and if there are any lingering questions, doubts, or differences, uh, we can address them as we continue, as we go along. But basically now, what I want to do with the beginning of life issue, of course, we're going to focus now on the individual, right? In other words, the origin Ontogenetic, ontogenetically, and ontos, remember a little added value for this program is that you pick up a little Latin and Greek on the way, right? So ontos is being, being. Tell a little anecdote, when I went into the seminary uh, last century, in the end of the 70s, uh, literally, it was, it was last millennium, we can say that. <laughs> we all come from last millennium. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so, I had my bachelor's in biology from FIU, right? And I go into the seminary. So now we're gonna do the, our first philosophy and then theology because normally on a straight up track, say after high school, uh, young men who go into the seminary, they would normally do a bachelor's in philosophy. So they do four years of philosophy, get a bachelor's and then they go into theology, which is actually graduate school and it's four more years. Of theology plus one year of pastoral work in a parish where there is no study just parish life so really today coming out of high school the the academic part of um, becoming a priest is about eight years <laughs> all right parallel to medical career or something like that 
at any rate, those four years of philosophy, since uh, I already had a bachelor's in something, right? Then what they do is they concentrate all of the philosophy courses, which is maybe about 50 or 40 or 50 credits mm -hmm. uh, into one whole year, all right? And because the rest are what we call the GRs, the general education requirements, that's the American system. So for what, and that uh, program is called pre-theology, pre-theology. And that year that we went, that I went into the seminary was 79, 1979. We were four in pre-theology and uh, four of us, uh, two Hispanics and two Americans. And the four of us already had degrees in something. One was in business, the other one was in uh, uh, culinary arts. <laughs> uh, it was, one had a, actually a PhD in biochemistry. <laughs> um, so we go in and we're the pre-theologians and so we're getting all this concentrated philosophy, but none of us had really had uh, that level of philosophy at the, at the college level. I had some philosophy when I was in high school with the Jesuits. Uh, back in Mexico City. And I remember one of the classes was, uh, one of the courses is ontology, which is the study of being. And the professor who's great, he's retired now, but he was a great philosopher at St. John Vianney Seminary, the one that's next to St. Brendan in the Southwest area, Westchester area, okay, near Columbus High School, near there. All right, that's where we have our diocesan, the, the philosophy seminary, the college seminary. So he was Hispanic and he kept talking about being and being and he was so much emphasis on being. And I thought that he was talking about beans like, you know, black beans and lima beans. <laughs> exactly, Jack and the bean. <laughs> and I was totally clueless <laughs> of this bean. <laughs> but eventually I got it, all right? And uh, philosophy, straight up philosophy can get a little esoteric at times. <laughs> but anyway, that in Latin or Greek is ontos, which is the substance. And grammatically, there's a parallel to it. It's actually the substantive, right? The being. So when we talk about human being, we talk about the human, the human person. Uh, but when we talk about a dog or a parrot, it's also a parrot being or a dog being, but we don't say the being part of the, of the dog, <laughs> okay, or bacteria being. We're talking about the, the actual existence of these things, of these nouns, of this substance, okay, the substantive. Uh, so it means basically the ontogenetically is our origin because genesis is also origin, right? So, Another way, way of saying all this in simple terms is when does life begin? When does life begin, right? And so right away, we're gonna jump into a hot topic because according to how we answer that question, when does life begin, and specifically human life, then that has consequences. So it has consequences, all right? So we're gonna do a little philosophy and theology in this course in addition to the biology that we always do because of the bioethics. Basically, this course is going to look at the origin of humans individually for each one of us, which by the way, is also a universal process. And this always helps to validate and confirm. That's why the bioethics that we do, even though it is Catholic bioethics, as you've noticed, it's principled bioethics, it's also evidence-based because we allow nature to tell us. Just as we allowed nature by way of the fossil record and the phylogenetics to tell us about evolution, now we're going to allow nature to tell us mostly through uh, sexual reproduction and early embryonic development, when life begins, okay? So the first half of this course is going to be a little bit of biology. And then we'll do the ethic analysis based on that. Again, if you have questions, comments, stop me at any point. Otherwise, uh, we're gonna move forward. So moving forward, it turns out that there are two modes of reproduction that we have discovered so far on this planet, which again is the only planet that we know of so far that actually has life that we have been able to, to measure and to validate life. And again, when I talk about life, 
generally, I'm talking about organic biological life. I'm not talking about the life of the angels or the life of the blessed trinity. I'm talking about life as we know it here on Earth, which has two characteristics, by the way, two characteristics that are measurable, so they are empiric, okay? And they are uh, metabolism and reproduction. Another way of saying metabolism is body functioning. All right, in other words, uh, all of the functioning of our organs and tissues and systems globally, that's what uh, uh, in the medical profession is called metabolism, and that better work well, otherwise we are ill, okay? And that's how we can tell organically that a thing is alive. So that we see a rock, a rock is not metabolizing, you know, and this phone, as lively as it looks, it's not metabolizing as such, because organic compounds are not being uh, synthesized and broken down. But for living things, they're metabolizing. And precisely when metabolism breaks down and disorder takes over, all right, then we call that the death process. That organism has begun to die, which typically is also irreversible. We'll say more about that in the second half at the end of life issue, of uh, course. So that's one characteristic is to be alive, is to metabolize. And the other one is to reproduce. In other words, to generate another one like myself, one way or another. Because otherwise, we only have one generation, right, of these uh, metabolisms, <laughs> okay, of these metabolic bags, as uh, chemists like to put it. We're just one big bag of, of uh, organic compounds <laughs> interacting. But unless this metabolic bag is able to generate another one like myself, then that's the end of that species because that's the last generation. Okay, so reproduction is another example. It's another requirement for being alive. And that's why viruses technically don't qualify as being living is because they have to sequester the uh, metabolism and the reproductive process of the host cell that they invade. They themselves are unable to uh, reproduce on their own. So basically, the most we can say about them is that they're a very sophisticated organic crystal, <laughs> right? Because uh, they have the DNA inside, or sometimes RNA if they're retroviruses, and then the protein code, and they can in fact be very geometric, right? But by themselves, they're unable to uh, reproduce, and therefore they don't really qualify biologically as living. Mm -hmm. But back to the living from bacteria forward, like uh, the, remember the four main groups, the bacteria and archaea. Then we have the um, protozoans, we have the um, fungi, plants and animals. These two processes are universal, metabolism and reproduction, no matter whatever species we have discovered, they have these processes going on, all right? Now, with regards to reproduction, we also find two modes of reproduction. We find asexual and sexual reproduction. Again, back to the Latin a little bit with the prefix is a, it is a negation. So you can substitute a for non, non-sexual, right? Whereas sexual is going to involve gametes or sex cells, the egg and the sperm typically, even though some uh, more primitive animals like echinoderms, like the starfish and sea urchins and so forth, they have what is known as isogametes. In other words, they're not male or female, they're just gametes, but they are haploid. In other words, when these isogametes come together, they restore that diploid number or the paired number of chromosomes, which is really biologically the nitty gritty of uh, sexual reproduction is to restore the chromosome pairs chromosome pairs for the new individual. We'll get there. Today's lecture is mostly on asexual reproduction. And it will be the only one really because then from next Saturday forward, we'll be involved in sexual reproduction and early embryonic development or the full development but focusing on the first couple of weeks of embryonic development, okay? So again, evidence-based means that Whatever species we have discovered so far of the two million more or less that have been classified, they all reproduce either asexually or sexually or sometimes both. They have both qualities of sexual and asexual happening mostly on the, the plants. 
but also uh, some animals. Okay, so uh, let's move forward then. We're gonna look at uh, reproduction in nature and we're also gonna do in the second part of the lecture today after the break, we're gonna look at DNA genetics a little bit, look at the DNA molecule in a little more detail because that is truly the molecule of in inheritance. We can say the molecule of life. I, I find it fascinating to consider and to ponder that that generating the next generation is passed on, the code is passed on by a single molecule that is what we call a macromolecule. In other words, it's made up of millions of atoms and it is compacted and it's a package of all our identity passed on on a single cell to the next generation. It is amazing that the process has become so, so elegant that with a single molecule, this DNA molecule, all of the characteristics, the genotype that will produce the phenotype of the next generation is passed on through a single cell or a pair of cells, in the case of gametes, with fidelity, so that the next generation actually comes out looking like the previous generation and remains within the same species. Okay, very interesting. Okay, so with regards to asexual reproduction, there are uh, many different types of varieties uh, or examples of asexual reproduction, okay? Both in bacteria and in um, multicellular organisms, again, fungi, plants, animals. And these are some examples here, binary fission, budding, vegetative propagation, sporogenesis, Fragmentation and regeneration, clones, uh, in the case of humans and other mammals, for example, monozygotic pretty. Then parthenogenesis and uh, uh, good old mitosis, which is just straight up cellular division, right? Happening right now in our bodies. That's how our tissues uh, and organs grow and develop. So I'm just gonna give you some examples of each, uh, beginning with binary fission. Again, back to the Latin class, fission is division, fusion is coming together, okay? So fission is division, whereas fusion is coming together. For example, when you hear about atomic fission, all right, or nuclear fission, watch out, because that's an atomic bomb. <laughs> nuclear fission is breaking the atom and releasing the tremendous amount of energy that is compacted into an atom, into the subatomic particles, all right? So nuclear fission is the breaking up of that atom, which is an atomic bomb. In this case, we're not gonna get into bombs, it's just a reference of the splitting that is used in the word, and binary is just a reference to two, it splits into two. Again, we use fancy words because scientists don't like people to understand them, but this is the same thing as saying one cell splitting into two cells, okay? Uh, the most common example is bacteria, and that's why they reproduce so fast, because generally these divisions take about 20 minutes, okay? Under ideal conditions, they take 20 minutes, and so if you have a duplication every 20 minutes, that's a very fast, it's a geometric progression, right? From one to two, two to four, mm -hmm. four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, uh, 300 and something 16. So in five or six divisions, you're already into the thousands. In about seven divisions, you're into the, uh, sorry, in five divisions, you're into the hundreds. In six divisions, you're into the thousands. And in about eight divisions, you're into the millions <laughs> because it's a geometric progression, it's exponential, all right? The number doubles under ideal conditions every 20 minutes, and that's why infections are so dangerous and so forth with these bacteria, because they're undergoing binary fission, which is an example of asexual reproduction. These are actual photographs. These are uh, micrographs, electronic, uh, electron micrographs. You can see uh, one bacterium here beginning to split into two. This one is further along, and this one even further. Uh, some of these have already split. This one is just getting started and so forth. You can see how bacteria under ideal condition uh, just uh, undergo binary fission, okay? 
It also happens in the group of protozoans that uh, grab bag of uh, protozoans. Remember paramecium from high school, the paramecium, all right? You can see them splitting here. Now it's lengthwise, longitudinal. Uh, everything has to double before the split. So the nucleus has to double, for example, and the organelles and so forth before the split so that each daughter cell, we call them the mother cell and the daughter cells, end up with the same amount of um, equipment of organelles uh, as the mother cell, especially the nucleus. So the DNA duplicates. <coughs> is that Marie or Ada? Marie, maybe you're coughing a little. You may want to um, mute your, your mic, okay? And uh, just open it when you have a question or something like that. Okay, so I'm making emphasis that the nucleus has to duplicate or the DNA within the nucleus has to duplicate before the split. That's very important because also for sexual reproduction, the same thing needs to happen, all right? Before the gametes are formed, that nucleus has to duplicate and it's a very significant process. You'll see what is the meaning of that. Here is an amoeba that is actually time. This is a time progression, uh, photographs, time lapse. You see beginning to split here, and finally the, the split takes place, and the two daughter amoebas are essentially identical to the original mother, who is no longer around because it's split into two, all right? And they are essentially clones. So all of the asexual reproduction are really, as far as the genetics is concerned, they're clones. Mm -hmm. Another example now in um, yeast, for example, which is a type of uh, fungus, okay? Yeast has this little budding, these little buds come off like that and they grow a little larger. Eventually when they get large enough, they split off into a new yeast, all right? And leaves a little scar behind. So you can see that this yeast here, this mother cell split one, two, three, four, five times already, maybe this is a sixth one, all right? And they just keep pushing out these little buds, which eventually uh, break off and form a new yeast cell. This is a single cell. Uh, and uh, yeast is good and bad. It is good when it rices bread, right? It's used for ricing the bread. And uh, the bubbles, uh, so the loaf of bread, for example, even the, what do I have over there? The uh, bagel, thank you. <laughs> have a little, little holes in them. Cuban bread, Puerto Rican bread has bigger bubbles, okay, or bigger holes. Those are carbon monoxide bubbles, which is a product of fermentation. It's a product of ferment, byproduct of fermentation done by the yeast. And so, uh, but that, see, uh, CO, that carbon monoxide, dissipates out into the atmosphere, so it's non toxic or anything like that. It's edible. So that's the good part of the yeast. The bad part is the yeast infection, <laughs> all right? Different kind of yeast can cause an infection. And so, uh, at any rate, they reproduce by budding, which under ideal conditions can also, that infection can grow uh, very fast. Another example with uh, these creatures that are called salenterates, these are uh, anemones, jellyfish, uh, hydras, all right, corals, for example. It's an example of a little bud here that as it grows uh, to a certain size, it will eventually clip off and become an independent new little hydra. Mm -hmm. Hydras are typically freshwater, whereas the anemones and the corals are saltwater, but uh, they're the polyp um, of uh, salenterates. Okay, so those are examples of budding off. In the plant world or kingdom, we have something similar. It's called vegetative propagation, which are little shoots that are put out. If uh, you go to your lawn and you see the tufts of grass, right, and you pull one tuft, you'll get a string, little shoots and stalks that connect other little tufts, and you get a whole string of tufts coming out. All right, that is by vegetative propagation. It's all asexual, there are no gametes involved. Uh, they just put out these little stalks and bury into the ground, and then 
that little stock will eventually put out a new uh, uh, plant, a new tuft. It also happens in some uh, bushes and small uh, plants. Okay, and even trees, uh, it can happen with trees. Um, for example, the aspen, if you've ever been up north or in the Rocky Mountains, uh, they are these whole forests of aspen that they turn yellow in the spring, right? I'm sorry, in the fall. And it's been determined that aspen are actually clones of each other. Why is it so big? Oh, because I made a big. These aspen, which are just beautiful in the fall, actually when you go underground, so the top part of the plant is called the shoot, the bottom, what's in the ground is called the root system, but from the ground up it's called the shoot system, right? And uh, these aspens underground are actually all connected by stalks of, um, they're not actual roots, they're stalks that are underground and then shoot up new saplings uh, at some distance and they can generate a whole forest but all these guys are clones of each other and they're they're basically all interconnected underneath <laughs> okay so that's another example of vegetative propagation in addition to that as you can see here this uh, uh, bush also has flowers and if you look closely at Grass, grass can also put out little flower, grayish flowers, right? Little fluffy. The flower, what's the reproductive organ of plants? It's the flower, okay? So uh, they also reproduce sexually. But asexual reproduction is more economic. It saves energy because it's estimated that on average, sexual reproduction takes about twice the amount of energy, twice the kilocalories, let's say, for the plant to reproduce sexually than asexually, all right? Also with, with uh, animals. So uh, it's more economic to reproduce asexually. The downside is that the offspring, the next generation, they're all clones. They're all essentially identical, so there's no variation. And so uh, natural selection has nothing to act on. It's fine as long as the climate stays about the same, but if there is significant climate change, and there's no variation, then they can take a big hit and be wiped out, the, those uh, species. So the advantage in anticipation, the advantage of sexual reproduction is to um, include or to introduce uh, variation for the next generation, all right? Within the same species, but variation. So it will be normalized, typically they're, they're normalized uh, variants. Okay, moving forward in fungi also, I mentioned it also happens for fungi, sorry. And fungi have this cycle, which is one cycle is 2N, there's supposed to be a 2N in here, that I'm not seeing because it's in black. <laughs> but the N just is a reference to the number of uh, chromosomes paired or unpaired. So this is one N or unpaired chromosomes, whereas this phase here is uh, paired chromosomes. At any rate, this stage of mitosis of producing from spores to produce the gametophytes, this is through asexual reproduction. And then you can see the fusion of gametes here. So this is the sexual reproduction part, and this is the asexual, the production of spores, and then the growing into the gametophytes. Uh, this is the asexual phase of the life cycle of these uh, of fungi. It also happens in primitive plants like mosses and uh, ferns, okay? So that's another example, sporogenesis of asexual reproduction. A few more, back to the animal kingdom, fragmentation and regeneration. And uh, this happens, for example, in salentarates, particularly starfish. If a starfish loses an arm, it will grow back the arm Sometimes it gets confused and grows two instead of one, <laughs> okay? And typically they will not grow as long as the original arm, but they will function as arms, uh, including the little eye cells that they have at the tip and all that, all right? So we regenerate this part. 
But not only that, also the arm that broke off may regenerate uh, new little arms and become a new starfish in its own right. Okay, so the fragmented part may also become a new individual. Therefore, it's a type of asexual reproduction. And basically, as long as this arm contains part of what is known as a central disc. The central disc is basically, if you do a circle around here, touching the tips of the, the base of the arms, all right, that's called a central disc. And as long as this broken off arm contains a piece of the central disc, it will regenerate the other arms that were missing, okay, and become a new starfish in its own right. Uh, which means that basically what's there at the cellular level, what's on the central disc? The stem cells. The stem cells that regenerate, the, so they're that plastic, right, that they're able to regenerate the whole uh, animal from there, okay? It also happens in um, flatworms like planarias and also tenia, tenia solius, which is uh, the tapeworm. Uh, many of the flagworms are parasites, some are free living. They can be chopped up into pieces and each piece will become a new individual. All right, so they have uh, a lot of regeneration power. Their cells are very plastic, stem cells, and so each segment can regenerate into a new individual. So from one planaria, planarium, we can get up to three new ones. All asexual, non-sexual reproduction. Another example, very different, but really at the base of it, it's all uh, different styles of cloning, is when we have um, monozygotic twinning. You know, there are two types of twinning, right? There are identical twins and there are fraternal twins. Mm -hmm. And identical twins have to be of the same sex, whereas fraternal twins can be boy or girl, or boy boy or girl girl, right? But they can be of the different sex also. That is telling us their origin. How did they get started? Well, for um, fraternal twins, it happens that in that cycle, that woman ovulated two eggs. They could be on the same ovary or uh, opposite ovaries, but she happened to ovulate or mature two eggs to ova. And of course, there are millions of sperm around, so whatever egg is present and mature is gonna get fertilized on average. So for fraternal twins, you have two eggs that get fertilized by two sperm, and therefore you have two individuals from the very beginning, all right? And of course, which cell, which gamete is the one that determines the sex, the egg or the sperm? The sperm, because eggs only have X chromosome, whereas sperm, half of the sperm will be X uh, sperm and the other half will be Y sperm. So it depends which one of those two sperm fertilizes. If it's an X sperm, have an egg chromosome, then X sperm plus X egg is gonna be a girl, female, XX. But if it's a Y sperm, then that Y sperm for life in an X egg will make XY a boy, all right, male. So that's for fraternal twins. Two separate eggs, two separate sperm, two separate embryos from the very start. Monozygotic twins is different, and that the word is telling you, again, the, the scientific uh, nomenclature, Mono is a reference to one, like uni, mono, whereas bi is two, tri is three, tetra four. Mono is a reference to one, and zygotic is a reference to the zygote, which is a fertilized egg, which by definition is no, no longer an egg because now it's diploid, all right? So the fertilized egg is what we call technically a zygote. And that zygote is a single egg, a single ovum that was fertilized by single sperm. And within the first two weeks of embryonic development in the human, that fertilized egg, that early embryo, has the capacity to split into two. And even each one of those two to split again. So you can get uh, quadruples. <laughs> of a, very rare, okay? The more splits there are, the more rare it is. But the, just the normal, let's say, the first level of split into twins, those will be identical twins. We call them monozygotic, okay? And it depends when the split happens within those first two weeks, if they're going to have two placentas or if they're going to share a placenta. 
depends on when the split happens, if it happens early or later, within those two weeks, how many if they have their own placenta or if they're gonna share placenta. Maria, right, yeah. right. welcome, got a hand out for you. Okay. We'll be recording so you can catch up. All right, so this is another example of asexual reproduction. It's a monozygotic twinning, otherwise known as identical twinning. And that's why they have to be of the same sex, you see, because it's a single sperm fertilizing. In humans, I think it's about one in 64, just for monozygotic twin. It's rare, but it's not that rare. It's on average, because this was my first dissertation in Rome in the 90s, I remember uh, just coming across that number. For monozygotic twins, is about one in 64. So it's rare, but it's, you know, it's less than one in 100. <laughs> So it's, of, of monozygotic twins, of all pregnancies, of all human pregnancies, on average, one in 64 is a monozygotic twin. Yeah, it's pretty high, yeah. yeah. So it's not that rare, it's not that uncommon. And in fact, you know, monozygotic twins, I mean, they have been made from the start. Uh, of course, they have their own soul and everything else, so they're full human beings and there are pressures for doing studies, for doing genetic studies and all that because they are identical to each other. So one can become the experimental and the other one can become the control and vice versa. So they're used a lot for um, uh, medical experiments, clinical experiments, but uh, so there are quite a few of them around. Mm -hmm. Yes? So would it be accurate to say that maternal twins, because they are two separate eggs, so yep. The mother ovulates with two separate eggs. Mm -hmm. Would that be more a hereditary feature of the woman? Not it's so much the man, because that would run in her family to do that, and the man really has no. Right, right. It's definitely, but even the dizygotic, it's not really known why twinning happens. At least when I was studying this in the 90s, uh, it's not really known why twinning happens. But there has to be obviously some mechanism behind it, all right? And it seems like some families, there is a preponderance. There is a, uh, what do you call that? A predisposition, well, right? Well, I was asked that, but I got a very fine my obstetrician, and probably all of them are getting twins in your family. They, uh, they, uh, they ask that. Uh-huh, yes. I was wondering, but the difference would be because the woman herself is producing multiple eggs rather than right. one, maybe that is something Right, on fraternal twins. Yes. So on fraternal twins, perhaps it is more on the maternal side, yes. So I don't really know if the sperm has anything to do with the twinning in identical twins, it could be. But I suspect it's mostly on the egg side, also because it could be cytoplasmic factors, or cytoplasmic factors come mostly from the egg, right? Because the sperm has very little cytoplasm uh, to contribute. Uh, and then the nucleus, well, yeah, there are two different nuclei from two different individuals, but I, I'm suspecting it's more factors that are in the cytoplasm that are interacting with the genetics and causing that. Essentially, what you have is, because remember the Morella, actually, I'm anticipating next week's lecture. The next stage of development after the zygote is the Morella, which is uh, two-stage, four-stage, eight-stage, six stage in stage cells. All those cells are also identical to each other. They all have the full potential of becoming a new individual. So it's just a question of that mitosis splitting totally and not maintaining the integrity of the one embryo. If the, if the cells in the morula split apart, each one of those cells has the potential to become a new individual. Yes, Simon? So what Aggie's asking, my, I don't want to characterize it as an error in the programming of right. the mom. And I don't want to say it's quite evolution. It's some sort right. of variant. It is a variant. May have not, uh, yeah, I don't want to say natural, <coughs> but it's a variant that actually just happened and now exists with us. Not, I'm not saying, it, it, I mean, obviously it, it could be evolution now because as it's gotten into the end, but at some point, it might have been um, just a, a chance. Error, a yeah. chance could have been a mutation, a chance occurrence okay. that did not was not selected out, survived the selecting process. 
and state, okay? But we can use the word abnormal in the technical sense because it's off the norm. The norm is just singletons, right? But so anything that's off the norm is abnormal by definition, all right? Uh, but it's an actual abnormality that doesn't mean that these kids themselves are abnormal. It's the process that is abnormal. But the children that come from there are, on average, perfectly normal, okay? They are technically high risk, and correct me please, the nurse, uh, they're a high risk pregnancy. More than a single tone is gonna be a high risk pregnancy, simply because the same space is shared out. <laughs> All right, so uh, the young one is a high risk pregnancy, no, how, no matter how you uh, view it. But they survive. Uh, sometimes they're preemies, uh, or they typically, tend to have uh, low birth weight, right? But they can also develop fully and she's just gonna be very big <laughs> in her pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyway, we'll come back to this issue a little bit more when we look at uh, sexual reproduction because of the early embryonic development. Want to cover a couple more examples before the break, which is uh, parthenogenesis, okay? And this is another interesting phenomenon. Again, back to the Greek here, Parthenos. Parthenos is virgin, exactly. It's a reference to virgin, right? The Parthenon, um, the temple of the virgins. So uh, Parthenos is virgin and Genesis origin, in this case, birth, more directly. So virgin birth, this is literally the virgin birth in nature. It happens in a few animals, uh, mostly reptiles and fish. Uh, for example, this species of lizard, which is a European lizard. Uh, her eggs, by some stimulus, begin embryonic development without the benefit of sperm, okay? So you can think of it this way, that mechanically the sperm is a trigger that causes the egg to begin embryonic development. But that trigger is not there. The mechanical trigger of the sperm is not there. But there's some other trigger that causes those eggs, those ova, to begin development. All right? And uh, that development then will lead to eventually an adult, which will produce more eggs. And the stimulus can be in nature. The stimulus can be either mechanical, but most likely a chemical or a temperature thing similar to the temperature that changes the actual sex of the turtles in the, in the shell, right? When the female turtle comes to the beach and lays her eggs down there, digs a hole maybe uh, one meter depth, two, three, four feet deep, lays the eggs, and then she puts the sand back on top of all that, and the sun will rise afterwards, and for days and days the sun will rise and fall, and that sand is getting heated and cool and heated and cool, depending on the length of days and the amount of heat or lack thereof, those little turtles will hatch either as male or female, just based on the temperature and the temperature ratio and the temperature pattern that those eggs received, all right, those shells. Uh, so that is a thermal stimulus. Uh, so these, um, it hope also, ha also happening is these um, uh, snakes. These are called Bellamy snakes. They're the most common snakes around actually. They're blind and uh, they typically live just around the root system of uh, bushes and plants. Uh, we have some out here. One time I was just digging a hole there and I found a Bellamy snake. <laughs> uh, and they also reproduce parthenogenically. Also some fish, these are sharks. It's a type of shark that the egg is stimulated here. It's put as an electrical stimulus. So obviously this is done in the lab, right? Uh, the egg is shocked, a little electrical shock, and will cause that egg to start splitting into the morula pattern. And eventually you get the little shark babies coming out of there, just identical to the mother. Now, what is the necessary condition for all these adults to produce this phenomenon? They all have to be females, right? Because they're producing eggs, they're producing ova. And from females, you can only get females. <laughs> so in this species, they're all females. Hmm? Interesting, okay. 
Yeah, exactly. So that's an example of parthenogenesis is rare, but it does happen in a number of species and that's how they do it. Okay. Finally, we get to good old mitosis, which is happening right now in our cells, the trillions of cells that we have. You know, how do we get there from a single fertilized cell? We're all through this process of mitosis. So this is a universal process. It's occurring in all plants, animals, fungi that are living today. So you got mitosis, your ptosis, everybody's ptosis is what are right now as we speak, okay? And it is a process that again, is very elegant at the cellular level because it starts at, as a cell in interphase, like for instance, this one here. These cells, you can tell, are they plant or animal cells? Well, you can tell they're plant cells because they're so square looking, rectangular, right? That's actually the cell wall which is made out of cellulose, similar to a shoebox. So we take a balloon and we fill it with water and we put the balloon inside a shoebox. That's kind of mimicking what's happening here. The, the skin of the balloon, it will be the cell membrane, which is flexible and elastic. But the box itself is the wall, the cell wall, which is made out of, of uh, cellulose sheets and is rigid. And that's what gives trees the capacity to live and grow against gravity and be able to go five, six, ten stories high and not collapse because of the cell wall in each individual microscopic cell that is holding up so that the trillions of little boxes that is holding up that tree. All right, all because of the rigidity of the cellulose sheets, which is a type of uh, carbohydrate, complex carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the cell wall. Uh, at any rate, we start with a single cell like this, and also in nature, these are transparent, okay, or translucent. We wouldn't see them if we see this under the microscope. This is probably an onion skin. As you peel the onion, you get a little skin in between layers, all right, that's a single cell layer. So it's very nice for, yeah, that's a single cell. It's uh, very nice for observing. You don't have to use a diatom or anything. Uh, to cut, uh, just peel the onion and in between the thick layers could be one thin layer that is a single cell. You can stain that and watch it uh, under the microscope. So this is stain, uh, it's mostly staining the nucleus as you can see and the chromosomes, all right, so that it can be visualized. And the little dot inside is a higher density, it's called the nucleolus. It's a higher density of uh, DNA and may have some RNA in it also. It basically starts as a single cell like this. And then that cell, when it's not reproducing, the cell is called interphase, interphase, and it's metabolizing. So the cell is either reproducing or metabolizing. When the cell is going to reproduce, metabolism is shut down to the minimum and the ocho metabolism is going to be concentrating on duplicating the chromosomes and getting them ready for the actual split, all right? So you can see that uh, when the cell is not reproducing, you don't see distinct chromosomes. It's all one big fiber in there, one big DNA fiber that's called chromatin. I'll talk more about that after the break. But basically when the cell is going to reproduce, then that chromatin condenses further and split into discrete segments that we call chromosomes. And they can be stained, they're higher density, and so they pick up more stain. And these are the chromosomes being um, uh, distinguished here, all right, condensed. And here they're even more condensed. At some point, once the chromosomes have duplicated, now they will migrate to the equator also the, the the nuclear membrane will dissolve and now the chromosomes are free inside the cell. They will line up at what we call the equator of the cell. So of course it's uh, twisted uh, sideways, but the equator is the middle of the cell. The chromosomes will line up there. Imagine all the regulatory mechanism that is all chemical signals for this to happen, right? microscopic, super microscopic, complex, but elegant in that it happens every time mitosis happens the same way for millions of years, 
you know, up to right now that is happening in our body trillions of times with our cells, okay? So the elegance is just amazing. Line up at the equator, and then the next stage is that mm, they are literally pulled by some microfibers that are inside the cell to opposite poles. And that's where the duplicate splits, all right? And the they duplicates uh, split from each other and migrate to opposite poles of the cell, uh, getting ready to form the two new nuclei. All right, so here you see them migrate into opposite poles and eventually they condense further at, at those poles. Uh, here's another example. Okay, this is the beginning of the migration. This is the end of the migration. Eventually, these uh, chromosomes will then form a new nuclear membrane around each one of those two densities. And the chromosomes will then uh, attach to each other and go back to the chromatin stage. All right, and the last thing that forms then once the two new nuclei are formed, then the cell wall is built in the middle, right? So wall is built, and we end up with two new cells. So these are the two daughter cells, which are identical to the original mother cell where they came from. But the mother cell is actually gone, okay? All right, so that's mitosis. It's a universal process. It happens plants, animals, fungi, you name it, it happens. The last stage that I want to talk about, so these are all examples of types of asexual reproduction. And I just want to talk briefly about why does a cell have to split, like mitosis, uh, just before the break, okay? And it is essentially a surface to volume ratio issue. <laughs> A bit of uh, thinking here. This is what's happening. As the cell grows, so here's a mother cell, all right? That cell is generally growing in size because it's taking in water. Many of the solutes, many of the chemicals that the cell needs are dissolved in water. So they'll come in in a liquid phase and the cell is slowly growing and growing. As the cell grows, what happens? The surface is duplicating, but also the volume is duplicating. But the problem is that the ratio is unequal because as the surface duplicates, right? It's, uh, the surface is only doubling because it's a two-dimensional surface. By definition, even if it's spherical, all right, it's on a curvature, but the surface is two-dimensional. Think of the skin of, of a balloon. But the volume inside is three-dimensional. So when the volume duplicates, you know, it actually cubes. <laughs> and so the cell, you can think of it this way, the cell is actually growing larger inside than on the surface. At some point, that surface becomes too taut, just like putting water inside a balloon. At some point, the, the surface of the balloon can't take it anymore. It's too stretched out, all right? So it has to do something to reduce the ratio of surface to volume, all right? And it does that by splitting because as the cell splits, it has split the surface from the original cell, but it has also split the volume. So it has cut the surface in half, but it has also cut the, the volume in half. So it has gain in every split because the volume is more voluminous, <laughs> right? So by splitting the volume in half, now that new surface has a chance to stretch out again, all right? And so basically it's a kind of a mechanical thing that a cell surface can only stretch so far before it explodes. Mm -hmm. And so it is, kind of doomed, if you will, to split, therefore mitosis, all right? It's, it's cells are doomed to split and split and split until there's another process that is called cell death or apoptosis. Apoptosis, which is natural cell death. At some point, the cell kind of realizes internally that it cannot continue to metabolize anymore. Maybe it's missing some critical ingredients or 
uh, well, also it has to do with the telomeres, with the end of the chromosomes being nipped off. Every time there's a split, the, the chromosomes actually lose the little tips, little tiny ends, all right? So the chromosomes start getting narrower, and at some point it may start hitting the informational region, all right? And so the cell goes into a programmed death that is called apoptosis. And then that cell will start shrinking, <coughs> excuse me, and shriveling. And inside, the cell also has its own suicide pill, uh, which are lysozymes. They are, they are enzymes that digest. They're in a little bag, but if the bag breaks, the cell will start self-digesting. <laughs> it's amazing how the whole thing works elegantly. So what happens in an apoptosis situation is that the cell gets self-digested, and then all the cells around it will cannibalize it and essentially take up the nutrients that are left from that one cell. So nature is very economic, nothing is wasted. <clears throat> the only species that actually produces waste is us. In nature, everything gets recycled. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, I also had here somewhere a little list of some vocabulary. So I'll send you this, um, didn't print it, but I'll include it in the email with the um, materials for today. Onto, metabolism, cylinderase, inexorable, that it has to be this way, okay? Just like the clock only moves in one direction, cells are doomed to uh, undergo uh, mitosis all the time. Oh yeah, here it is, apoptosis, that's the spelling. This we'll see in the second part of the break. After the break, the organelles, like the nucleus, for example, and then compaction. Let's see if I have anything else in here. That's about it. Okay, so I'll send you this also. Uh, so we'll take a break here. Any um, questions or comments? No? Asexual reproduction, maybe different uh, varieties. But at the end of the day, it's all just different variations of uh, cloning in the sense that at the genetic level, the daughter cells have essentially the same DNA as the, the parent cell or the mother cell. All right. Okay, a little break. Thanks. I'm gonna pause here and pick up. Okay, Marie, so we're going on break, about 10, 15 minutes. All right, we'll be back. Okay, so welcome back everyone. Now we're going to get a little bit into genetics and the actual structure and function of the DNA as the molecule of inheritance. So it's going to get a little technical. And my bad fortune is that I tend to give more excess of detail <laughs> that is necessary for the point, really. Uh, but in case I get lost in the weeds uh, into the second half, uh, the basic idea here is that this molecule of DNA is the one that transmits all of the genes necessary for the next generation to be essentially of the same species as the previous generation. And that goes on generation after generation. So that at the molecular level is truly reproduction. It is reproducing, it is producing again. In the next generation, the previous generation of living organisms, right? So I just find it fascinating. In fact, um, uh, what is his name? Uh, I think he's still head of NIH, uh, uh, Francis, Francis Collins, right? He wrote a book. So Francis Collins is a Christian, not Catholic, uh, and apparently he's uh, devout, and he wrote a book, The Language of God, okay? The Language of God is very inspirational. But essentially for him, the DNA is the language of God in the sense that this thing is so well designed that it's a whole alphabet basically with only four letters in the alphabet. All of the genes of every species can be uh, deciphered and coded and passed on again from one generation to the next. So the language of God Francis Collins, okay? In fact, part of it, he actually talks about his own conversion experience going up the West Coast, the real West Coast, out in, uh, in an Oregon Trail and uh, the middle of winter and uh, Cascade and so forth. I don't want to 
spoil it for you, but it's a, it's a good little read. He also talks about forgiveness with regards to something that happened to his daughter while they were stationed in Africa. He's an MD by profession. Uh, and was doing missionary work in Africa. Okay, so DNA genetics. Let's look at a cell. And this is uh, structurally what we have inside the cell, what we have is um, organelles, okay? So the word organelle is kind of parallel to the organs of our body. Just like our organs do particular functions, well, organelles do specific functions in cells. And so this is a little saying that you've heard me say along the way, think functionally, right? Think functionally, because we don't see functions, we see structures. When I look at a door, I see a piece of wood or a piece of metal, whatever. But unless I see the door moving, I need to figure out intuitively what does the door do, okay? So we have these organelles inside our cells, and each organelle has a particular function. The one that is essential for the inheritance issue is the nucleus, because that is housing the DNA and it's all protection. Now I understand that for some of you, this is kind of elementary and, and basic stuff, uh, but for others, maybe not as much, so I'm trying to bring everyone on the same page, okay? Uh, so if it's a little too repetitious uh, from our high school biology or college biology, uh, bear with me, please. So the big organelle that we're concerned with uh, here in this course is the nucleus because it houses the DNA, okay? And so you see levels of magnification here. This is at the level of chromosomes and chromosomes are made up of this uh, twisted ladder uh, that is called the DNA. Twisted ladder, again, in um, scientific parlance, we call it the double helix, right? So I put it in here. Helix, a reference to the twist itself, and double because it has two rails, two rails. In contrast with RNA, which has a single rail, so it would not be a double helix, it would be a single helix. Um, So you'll learn some uh, technical terms that uh, are meaningful. Looking a little further into the structure, well, I had mentioned uh, chromatin. This is the difference between chromatin and chromosome. When the cell is an interface, in other words, the cell is metabolizing and not reproducing, right? Not undergoing mitosis. The, the DNA is in a chromatin stage. Chromatin stage means that the DNA is actually a little more open or a little less compacted than the chromosome. So segments of the chromatin DNA can be read, can be decoded, can be interpreted, because that's where the code is for proteins, for the protein synthesis. And this chromatin is a single molecule. This is the one that is well, they're all macromolecules because they have millions of atoms. And the DNA, the chromatin is a single DNA molecule inside the nucleus when the cell is just doing its function, it's metabolizing. When liver cells are producing bile and whatever, doing their function, when neurons are thinking, etc. If we were to take out this chromatin from a cell, from the nucleus of the cell, say on our skin, a single nucleus, and take out the chromatin inside and stretch it out, all right? Maintaining just a double helix, but unwinding the supercoiling, the coiling upon the coiling, and just the, the double helix stretched out like that, how long do you think it would be? A few inches, a few feet, a few kilometers? <laughs> well, it's about, about uh, six feet, actually. It's about two yards. And a yard is more or less a meter, so it's two meters. 
we want to take out a nucleus, a single nucleus for, from any one of our cells and take out the DNA, the chromatin from that nucleus and stretch it out, it would be about two meters long, which is an arm length and also a shoulder length. So about that long, doesn't matter if it's the left or the right uh, shoulder, okay? That's about uh, two meters there or six feet. So how is that compacted inside? That's precisely the word, the technical word is compaction is by this process of supercoiling, all right? And so we see that the DNA is condensed inside because it's a coil up, up, upon a coil. The first level of coiling, of course, is just the twisted ladder itself. That's the first level, that's just one coil. But then that gets twisted upon itself into supercoiling, all right? And this is what we have. Here is the double helix that coils around a little ball of proteins called histones, and that forms a basic unit, and that unit is called the nucleosome. So really the functional unit of DNA is the nucleosome. One nucleosome is a little ball of proteins with the DNA that once around it, 1.7 times, almost two times around. All right, and then it moves on to another little ball and winds around, and so we have this complex of uh, histone proteins wound almost two times around with DNA, almost like a little yo-yo, okay? And that is the nucleosome, which is the functional unit of DNA. These little nucleosomes wind on top of each other in another layer of supercoiling, that is a three-dimensional supercoiling, all right? until we get what is known as a DNA fiber. That fiber again coils upon itself to eventually form either the chromatin or the chromosomes. So it's coiling upon coiling upon coiling that causes the compaction of DNA. That's how we're able to fit two meters of DNA into a single nucleus inside a microscopic cell. It is amazing, it is just amazing, okay? But also very necessary functionally, because think about this, each one of our cells, that chromatin has how many chromosomes? And the human has the 23 pairs, has all 46 chromosomes, so it has the 10 to 20,000 genes that make up the whole body. Each cell has the entire genetic code, all right? The 20,000 genes. And so it's essential that this DNA be supercoiled and essentially shut down. So we can say that most of the genes are shut down most of the time in most DNA. And only little segments open up enough to be read, to be um, transcribed into an RNA uh, code that will then be sent to the nucleus for making the protein, the relevant protein. And it's important that the DNA is essentially shut down. 99.9999% of it is shut down. Otherwise, we will get expression all over the place and it will be simply chaos because neurons would be doing liver functions and kidneys would be doing uh, blood functions. You know, it will be total chaos. And so the DNA has to be shut down and that's what we call cellular specialization that only little segments of the DNA express the genes necessary for that particular cell function, for that tissue, for that organ, okay? So there's a whole hierarchy of order established here, and that whole order is regulated biochemically, biochemically by the same DNA itself, so the regulatory proteins and all that. Okay, uh, I got a little bit ahead of myself there, but let's go back here. So we have two basic levels of compaction or condensation. The chromatin, which is a little more loose as a single molecule, where uh, target uh, the replication machinery can find areas that it needs to replicate or the translation, uh, the transcription machinery, okay? Or when the cell goes into cell division, then that chromatin first splits up into discrete segments, 
and then those segments condense even further to the highest level of condensation, which is the chromosomes themselves. At the chromosome level, then there's no transcription going on, okay? Because that DNA is so compacted that no machinery can get in there to read any segment of it. That's a good thing because then that whole chromosome needs to be passed on to another cell, which in mitosis is gonna be a daughter cell or in meiosis is gonna be the actual gametes that will form the new organism. So this, at the level of chromosome, that DNA better be shut down tightly because that's the only thing that's gonna be passed on to make the new individual. All right, um, this is just a diagram of, uh, the, of the ideal chromosome. They don't actually all look like this in real life nature, but uh, this is kind of an idealized, just like we see the idealized cell with all the organelles in it, all right? And the center piece where the, the two pairs come together is called, or the two uh, sister chromatids come together, that's called the centromere. Um, that's what gets split up when they migrate to the opposite poles in meiosis. Okay, so bottom line, chromatin during cell interface when the cell is metabolizing, functioning normally, or chromosomes, condensed chromosomes, when the cell is dividing either through mitosis or meiosis that we'll look at uh, next week. One uh, simple example of this condensation is when we take a rubber band and we twist it, all right, and we keep twisting and twisting and twisting, it coils up on itself and forms a little wad, uh, but it's still the whole rubber band is there, it's inside that wad. Same here, only the, the folding and the infolding is much greater just made a piece of paper to um, tell you what is the level of folding, all right? So I take a piece of paper and I fold it once. So that's one fold, all right? One, that's one compaction, fold it again. That's two compactions. And now how many individual sheets do I have? I have four because it's a duplicating effect, right? So I fold it again. Now there are eight individual sheets, and this is the third level of folding or compaction and compacting that surface into a smaller area. Fold it again, that's the fourth level. Five, six. You wanna fold that any further? <laughs> I can't do it. All right, so six levels, and look how that piece of paper became so small. The level of compaction that is needed to fit two meters into a microscopic nucleus is about 10,000 volts. That's the level of infolding that occurs, okay, 10,000. So that's super condensed. The super coiling works because it shuts it down. All right, uh, that's what I worked on my second dissertation over at Purdue. That's why I, I ran across all these uh, details. Now, let's look at the twisted ladder for a while because this is the nitty gritty where the information is held. Uh, the twisted ladder, like a ladder, it has rails and it has rungs or steps, right? So rails and steps. The information is actually stored in the steps and the sequence of steps because like I mentioned, there are only four components to those steps, four bases, they're called bases, right? And these are the bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And they always pair up in pairs. So they always pair up in pairs. So there's certain rules that need to occur for the DNA to be functional. Adenine always pairs with thymine. And guanine always pairs with cytosine. All right, in nature, naturally. When this is mismatched, then that's a mutation. That's a type of mutation. So again, we like acronyms and we like uh, abbreviations. So adenine is abbreviated as A, thymine T, one in G, and cytosine C. An easy way to remember this is that straight letters pair with each other and curved letters pair with each other. <laughs> so A and T are straight on the uppercase, right? A and T are straight, they pair with each other. And C and G are curved, they pair with each other. <laughs> Just an easy way to remember. And so the base pairs here, you can see T, this is thymine, adenine, cytosine, thymine, cytosine, all right? 
That means if we know one strand, then we can deduce the pairing on the op opposite strand because of the base pairing. So it's very straightforward like that, okay? We know one strand, then we can deduce the pairing on the other strand, and that's called complementarity, uh, complementary pairs. And that's the code right there. That's the nitty gritty, is the sequence of these letters that make the DNA code, the genetic code. And the sequence specifically in triplets, because that's what's being picked up three at a time. So any three at a time form what we call one codon, on one code, one bit of code, <laughs> hmm? the, the triplets. That's called a codon. A little word in here. Hold on. Triplet, uh, sequential triplet spaces. Again, yeah. it can either be A or T or C or G. Those are the four possibilities. <clears throat> okay, so moving forward, the other characteristic is also that the um, DNA is anti-parallel. Oh, sorry, I skipped one. Well, so yeah, I talked about this already, the compaction. First, you start with the latter, and then it goes around. The little balls are called histone. They're also highly conserved. Highly conserved meaning that in nature, uh, most DNA, the, the coding for these proteins <coughs> is essentially the same. There are eight, there, there are four pairs of histones, histone one, two, three, and four. Uh, histone one actually is a linker in between, and then two, three, and four are involved in making the, the little ball. And they're in pairs, so it's a total of eight uh, little uh, clusters of uh, proteins the histones and the DNA once around uh, twice, like I said, almost twice, 1.7 times. This histone, the code for the histone proteins is highly conserved. In other words, when we look across <coughs> nature <coughs> from the histones in a human to the histones in a uh, fly to the histones in an amoeba, we find that essentially they have the same code. <laughs> They're essentially the same histones, essentially. Okay, very little variation. That, what does that tell us? It tells us that that protein also developed, that code developed very early on when there were ancestors of all of these organisms. And so it stayed, it stuck, it did not get selected out because it was economica, it was efficient, and it did not get selected out, all right? So in other words, it worked. So for nature, if it works, don't fix it. <laughs> All right, the other thing I wanted to mention a little bit, again, too much detail, but just uh, for you to be aware that the ladder, the rails of the ladder, are what we call anti-parallel because they go in opposite directions. The rail actually has a directionality, all right? For example, <clears throat> you see this little ring here. This is called a pentose. It's a five-corner uh, five or five-kink ring. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, it's a sugar ring. The, the kings, when they're not labeled, then it means it's a carbon. It's a carbon atom. This one, for example, is an oxygen, okay? But the other four are carbons. So this is a carbon ring. <clears throat> this is the sugar. This is the pentose that makes the latter connected with a phosphate. This P stands for phosphate. So this is the phosphate uh, connector. <clears throat> and the ladder will go in one direction, one way, and in the opposite direction, notice that the P's are facing this way, and here the P's are facing in the opposite direction. So they're anti-parallel, like this. That has to do with the machinery that reads the DNA, that reads the code, all right? Because you notice, for example, here the letters are going from right to left, 
but in the opposite, in the complementary strand, the letters are going from left to right. Okay, so the complement is also uh, a reverse complement. And that's what is called anti-parallel because the reading machinery will either go one way or the other, depending on what strand it's reading. <clears throat> Just for the sake of completion again, excuse me. <clears throat> this is the replication machinery or the transcription machinery, in this case replication because it's duplicating the DNA. It's um, essentially a two-step process. First, the helix has to be split open and it's done by this helicase. Whenever you see a word that, ha that ends in ASE, typically it's a protein, all right? So these are proteins, that's why the proteins do the work in the cell. Proteins are the workhorses of the cell. They are the ones in charge of metabolism. They're the ones doing the work. So this helicase is the one that splits the base pairing, all right? And in doing so, it is opening up the helix. What it's doing at the molecular level, it is splitting hydrogen bonds actually, because what's holding this together is hydrogen bonds, either double or triple bonds. You can see it here, between A and T, it's a double bond of hydrogen, the little dots, but between C and G, it's a triple bond of hydrogen. And that's why they have to pair specifically, because the double bond would not pair with the triple bond and vice versa, okay? That's one reason for it. The other reason is that uh, <clears throat> adenine and guanine are double bases, are double rings, whereas thymine and cytosine are single rings. So you need a total of three rings to maintain the two strands actually, the, the two rails actually parallel. So they don't kink in or out. You need a total of three bases in between the two base pairs, three, three rings. So that's another reason why they pair in the way they do. Uh, back to the replication machinery here for a moment, just again, kind of luxury of detail, I don't expect you to, to know this, but uh, you have it as a reference. <clears throat> the helicase splits the, uh, the helix itself, unpairs the bases, and then there's an actual replication machinery, which is called, uh, it's, uh, it's a polymerase, Again, a complex of proteins that lock into each strand and duplicate it. They duplicate it mechanically by taking nucleotides, free bases that are in the soup of the DNA, in the soup of the nucleus, and put them in place, lock them in place, and the bonds are reestablished so that each strand, the leading strand and the lagging strand, both get replicated. All right. There's, again, there are some technical issues on how this moves because they're actually only moving one direction. It's not shown here. This is a simplified diagram. But what happens in this process is that the DNA is actually duplicated because each complementary strand, when it's split in half, gets duplicated. So at the molecular level, this is the actual DNA duplication, which again, because we don't want people to understand it, we call it replication, okay? But DNA replication and DNA duplication is exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. So this is when the cell is undergoing mitosis or meiosis. The first thing that needs to happen before the cell actually splits is that the DNA is duplicated so that the daughter cells each end up with the same amount of DNA, the same number of chromosomes as the original mother cell, okay? Essential process, if this fails, that cell will not reproduce or will die or will just not reproduce. Okay. Uh, when the cell is not duplicating, it's not dividing, it's not undergoing mitosis or, mito or meiosis, the cell is an interface and the cell is metabolizing. All right, so let's look at the other alternative. 
when the cell is metabolizing the DNA is inside the nucleus. But the proteins that do the work are outside the nucleus, they are in the cytoplasm, what is known as the cytoplasm of the cell. In other words, the liquidy soup that makes the cell proper outside of the nucleus. And the proteins are the ones that do the work. But the protein sequence is determined by the DNA. So the information somehow has to go mechanically, physically, molecularly from the nucleus, from the DNA inside the nucleus to the actual machine that makes the proteins in the cytoplasm. The machine that makes the protein is called a ribosome, okay? It's another little organelle, that's what it does. So the message is sent out from DNA to ribosome by another type of nucleic acid. And this nucleic acid is RNA instead of DNA. So it's ribonucleic acid, okay? And specifically is known as messenger RNA. That's for the little m as messenger. So the messenger RNA is a single strand copied from the DNA molecule with fidelity, and that RNA now moves out of the nucleus through holes in the nuclear membrane that are called pores. Nuclear pores moves out into the cytoplasm and will eventually end up in one of these ribosomes, protein machinery, protein factory, and then that code is read out, is translated into a protein sequence. The protein sequence also has several stages at the original stage, just like DNA has bases and base pairs, proteins have amino acids. Those are the 20 amino acids that are in nature, alanine, guanine, uh, uh, what are some of the, phenylalanine, lysine, all of those amino acids that are in nature that we get through the food. Those are nutrients, right? That are needed for making proteins. And so these uh, protein machines, these ribosomes, as they read the RNA, they put these amino acids in a particular sequence. That's the codon. Each triplet, each codon codes for a particular amino acid. And that's the core, the genetic code. That's what Francis and Crick deciphered in the 1960s, the genetic code, all right? I'll show you a little map in a minute. Or, yeah, a table of the genetic code. So the amino acids are put in a particular sequence, and the first segment of the protein uh, of amino acid sequences is called a polypeptide, a polypeptide. It may have dozens to hundreds of amino acids. That's the first level of the protein, it's a polypeptide. Polypeptides coming together to form longer sequences or larger sequences, then make the protein as such. But the protein also has to be folded in a three-dimensional way for it to be functional, all right? So we have the primary level, the secondary level, tertiary, up to four levels of the protein to be functional, all right? And the actual functional protein is actually a protein complex. We have several protein subfactors coming together into a three-dimensional structure that is now functional. For example, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a complex of four subunits. Each unit is called a myoglobin. And these four units are essentially identical to each other. They come together, the four, and at the core, at the center of the four myoglobins, what is a nucleus of iron, Fe, iron, okay? And that's what makes the hemoglobin, the functional hemoglobin at the molecular level inside each RBC. Mm -hmm. And it's that iron that gets rusted, that gets oxidized when it comes to the lungs and in contact with oxygen. It comes FeO2, iron oxide, and rust typically is a reddish color and that's why blood looks reddish, <laughs> okay? Because it's oxidized uh, iron that is then transported from the lungs to the various tissues and it's an oxygen transport system. So again, the elegance here is just bewildering at the molecular level. It all works. It's working right now because we're alive and so is uh, the rest of nature. So at the end of the day, we have um, 
two processes for the DNA. Either the DNA is duplicating, which we call replication, and the cell is dividing, or if the cell is not dividing but metabolizing, then we have what is known as the central dogma. Transcription, translation from DNA to protein by means of an RNA intermediate, okay? So this is the first half of that process called transcription. Here's the DNA strand. Here it opens up and is uh, read out and transcribed into an RNA sequence, which is gonna be the complement. So for a T, there's gonna be an A, and for an A, it's gonna be a U instead of a T. That's one little change in RNA, but it has uracil instead of thymine, but it will correspond to the A, all right? It will complement the A. And cytosine will complement with G and so forth, so we get an RNA strand. So the change in RNA is that it has uracil instead of thymine. The two molecules look very similar, but that's just how it happened in evolution. So what we get from that process is a transcript, is the RNA transcript, which is called messenger RNA, mRNA. That goes out the pore, the nuclear pore, into the cytoplasm. And the second level is a translation from RNA to the actual polypeptide, polypeptide sequence. Here we have methionine, isoleucine, serine. These are three of the 20 amino acids that occur in nature, all right? And that's the beginning of the protein sequence, like wagons on a train, the polypeptide. Uh, this is a little bit more a diagram of what I was talking about, the four levels of the protein folding. We begin with just a sequence of amino acids, that's known as the primary level or primary structure. That sequence starts coiling upon itself and it forms basically two types of structures, either helices, which are known as alpha helices, or sheets, which are known as beta sheets. And the combination between these form the tertiary structure of the protein, three-dimensional, combination between helices and sheets. But then these subunits need to come together again into the final protein complex for it to be functional. And that's what we call the quaternary structure of the complex itself. This happens to be hemoglobin, so each one of these is a myoglobin, all right? Okay, so that's just for the protein uh, thing. When we put the central dogma together, Transcription and translation are the two uh, processes. Starting with DNA, gets transcribed into RNA, and RNA gets translated into protein. That is known in biology today as the central dogma of uh, genetics or molecular biology. Okay, and again, is universal. It is ubiquitous, this is how it happens for protein to be made in a cell, it has to go through this process of transcription and translation. Yeah. Very interesting that this, because it is universal and the sole process that we have observed so far for making proteins, which happen in the cytoplasm as opposed to the nucleus, then it stands to reason that this process was established very early on with the protocell with the original protocell, okay? Actually, they talk about an RNA environment and then a DNA environment as the RNA folded upon itself and uh, stabilized the loose bases by base pairing, forming hairpins and other structures. Could have been the origin of the DNA, which becomes a much more stable molecule. But at any rate, this process must have occurred early on, organically in an evolutionary process and it worked. So it locked in to this day about 3.8 billion years ago, okay, with the uh, cyanobacteria and those early organisms of which we have a few fossils uh, that have been observed around. Hmm? Remember the stromatolites? Hmm? Okay, so very interesting how this process is universal like that for every living species that we see. Uh, this is how proteins are made. 
So that is the genetic code. This is kind of a little summary for if the cell again is reproducing, it will undergo replication, the DNA, which is semi-conservative, semi-conservative meaning, go back here for a moment, semi-conservative means this, that for every new strand of DNA, for every new double helix that is formed, one of the two rails is from the original DNA, and the other rail is new, is synthesized new. Again, think of what I'm saying. Here's a DNA helix, right, before replication, before duplicating, this one here, okay? Now the replication machinery is going through. Since that double helix is split up, and each one of those strands is complemented, right, then it means that each new double helix, like this is a double helix, and eventually down here would be a double helix, or here it would be a double helix. Also. Each one of those new double helix, one of the rails is the original rail, and the other rail is the new one that was synthesized, okay? And so that's why we say that the code is semi-conservative because one of these codes, one of the base sequences, is from the original DNA, and the other one is the complement, which is the new one. And it happens on the other, on the complementary strand, the same thing. And so that's why we say that replication is semi-conservative because it maintains the code of one of the original strands. And functionally, we get from one, actually structurally, we get from one DNA chromatin, we get two DNA chromatins identical to each other. Those are gonna form the daughter cells, okay? So that's basically a duplication machine that occurs in the chromatin. Or if the cell is going to go reproduction, sorry, got it backwards. This one is for reproduction. If the cell is going to stay um, active in interphase and metabolize, then who does the work? The proteins. How do we get that particular protein, hemoglobin protein, and not another protein? Well, through the central dogma. The DNA strand is transcribed, a segment of it, not the whole thing, but just a segment of relevance, the genes that are needed. That gets transcribed into an RNA, and that messenger RNA is sent out of the nucleus, and then that messenger RNA gets translated into a protein sequence. For that, and there are thousands upon thousands of different proteins, insulin, you name it. Each protein has a particular function because the proteins are what we call the, the lock and key uh, model, whereas the protein is the actual key, all right? And the lock is where the function is gonna take place. So each key has an active site. That's the active site of the protein, three-dimensionally. That active site is the site of interest that makes the lock work. Mm -hmm. And so each protein has a particular active site. If that active site gets destroyed or mutated, it's a dysfunctional protein. It's gonna have some effects. It's gonna have uh, uh, diabetes or something because the insulin is misshaped. It's not working properly on the active site. The rest of the protein couldn't care less because it's not what is unlocking, is what is causing the, 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 the metabolic process that is needed. So again, I hate to keep repeating the word, but it's just amazing how elegant this thing works without us having to do anything consciously. <laughs> it just happens, all right? Because it's built into the nature that is tenacious and it continues, it thrives upon itself. As long, of course, as the necessary ingredients are there, which are gonna be basically the elements of uh, water and light and heat and so forth, and nutrients, all right. Uh, almost there, we've got a couple more slides. Uh, this is a summary chart of the DNA code, all right, or known as the genetic code. You see, uh, these are the triplets. Where are the, tri the triplets? Here is one of the triplets. And of course, it's translated into the, uh, into the RNA, okay, so it's put functionally a U instead of a T, because it's actually the RNA that's coding for the, for the amino acids, okay? 
So when you see a U here, you can think it's a T for DNA or it's a U for uh, RNA. So this is one of the triplets, the second of the triplets, or four of them, and the third of the triplet, you know the third of the triplet, each group has all four. That's what we call a wobble. The wobble is that the third triplet can be any triplet. The information is actually on the first two of the triplets. <laughs> the third one can wobble. I'll show you some examples. Um, the letters that you see here, the three letters are, this is the code for the uh, amino acids. They're 20, so you count it, glycine, arginine, serine, uh, histine, uh, aspergine, lysine, theramine, adaline, proline, etc. Okay, these are all the amino acids, and there should be 20 of them. But you notice that one amino acid or, uh, can be coded by several different codes. Let's take the very first one here. We have this box is a U, this box is a U, and this box is any one of the four. So that's how we get four here, okay? Or actually four here. So U, U, U is the first triplet, right? And it codes for uh, phenylalanine. BHE, phenylalanine, all right? Then if we get UUC, that's the second code, it also codes for phenylalanine. But if we have UUA or UUG, it's coding for leucine, which is a different amino acid. So the protein will be different. And if this amino acid is on the active side, it makes a big difference whether it's phenylalanine or leucine, all right? What's uracil? Sorry? Uracil, exactly, uracil. In the RNA, yeah, so it's giving you the functional RNA, the background DNA would be T instead of U, okay? Yeah, but it's uracil. Okay, so you see, now we have several things. If we do the math of four times four times four, we get, 64, okay, because four times four is 16, and 16 times four is 40 plus 24, plus 12 plus, uh, plus 16 is 40 plus 24, yeah. And that gives us 64. So there's 64 triplets, 64 possible triplets with the four bases but there are only 20 amino acids, okay? So that is what is called redundancy, that two or more triplets may code for the same amino acid. In fact, here, serine, for example, all four triplets, all four possible combinations of U and C, U, C, A, and G, on the third triplet, code for the same amino acid, okay? And that's what I meant by wobble, Wobble is on the third triplet. The third triplet can wobble and still give you the same amino acid, all right? So it's a characteristic, is redundancy is the third one, so it's probably, again, an evolutionary thing, that by the time the machinery got to the third one, it could put one instead of the other, and it's stuck. It's still coded for the amino acid, so it was not selected out. Mm -hmm. You still need a triplet, but the third triplet, there's more flexibility as to what the third triplet is. All right, then there are a couple that only have one. There's one that only has one possible triplet, which is methionine is AUG. And that is known as the start codon. That is the start because every protein, the first amino acid on every polypeptide sequence is going to be methionine. It's the head, <laughs> okay? And that's why it's a single amino acid. Only AUG codes for methionine. So if you translate this back into the DNA, what is the triplet on the DNA? A, T, G, okay? So on the transcription machinery, whenever there is an A, T, G, that, is, that starts a coding sequence. That can define a gene otherwise known as an intron, 
in a in a DNA in a chromatin molecule. Okay, the DNA when there's an AUG, typically that will code for the start codon on the protein, and therefore that starts a coding region, and then it can go downstream for dozens or hundreds or thousands of bases. And that segment, as long as it's got coding, it's got, it's got triplets that are significant, you know, that are informative rather, then that would be a protein sequence there, right? So now what can we do? Since the genome was decoded, right, the, the human genome, and it's online, the three billion base pairs in a sequence, <coughs> hmm, we can blast those three billion base pairs with computers that do the fast, fast crunch and they find an AUG. And on average, that's the start of a coding region. So we can determine the protein sequences, hypothetically, just from the DNA code. Then we can go into the lab and experimentally segment out that DNA code and see if it codes for a protein or not. And if it does code for a protein, then we can take that protein and see what the protein does. And we establish the function of the protein. So it's going to be just a fraction it's a segment, a, yes. A -A exactly, because it's going to be, exactly, it's going to be a polypeptide. And then those polypeptides have to come together. Inside. Exactly, yes. All right, so there will be many polypeptides that come together, and then there's alternative splicing also that occurs. So you name it, I mean, the, the elegance keeps getting more and more complicated. It's like a symphony when you have all these instruments playing at the same time, and the musical score just looks like a black piece of paper, but they're actual notes, okay, that each instrument will, will, will express. Each instrument will come in and out at a particular time. When you look at the musical score of um, this guy, Charles Ives, that has all of the instruments playing at the same time in different tones and everything else, it just looks like a big black blob of um, the, the actual score, but they're notes and each instrument will come in and out at their particular time. All right, so there is harming in this. It works because we're alive and this is at the molecular level what is keeping uh, nature alive. This is the molecular basis of metabolism. Mm -hmm. All right, now, almost done, hang in there. So we talk about DNA and RNA, DNA and RNA, and who hasn't heard about DNA and RNA, right? But then ask someone, well, what does DNA stand for? <laughs> and that's a different question because not everyone can spell out DNA or RNA. So here it is spelled out for you, okay? Deoxyribonucleic acid, it's mouthful. Whereas RNA, it's only ribonucleic acid. It's not deoxide. In other words, that accounts for the single strand and for a single rail as opposed to the double rail. Uh, so I just uh, underscore the, the acronym, the oxyribol, the ribol part, that's the reference to the pentose <laughs> on the rail, the sugar that I was talking about. And the rest, so the on DNA, that ribose is deoxide, uh, whereas in RNA is not deoxide. <laughs> Uh, the rest is just nucleic acid, which is the acid in the nucleus, because it's an acid and it's not a base. <laughs> but uh, the most informative part is the ribo or deoxyribo. So these are the base pairs here. Remember how I mentioned some are single rings? Cytosine and thymine are single rings, whereas guanine and adenine are double rings. And because of the pairing, so adenine and thymine always pair, right? You have a total across the rung, across the step, horizontally, you have a total of three rings, two from the adenine and one from the thymine. Guanine, the same case. Guanine pairs with cytosine. Guanine has a double ring. Cytosine has a single ring. So that's why they pair, because in order to maintain the two rails parallel, you can only have three rings across. Any three rings, but it has to be three rings. And that's why if one ring would pair with adenine, what's going to happen? You're going to have four rings and it's going to bulge out. 
is going to kink out the DNA, which is abnormal. The replication machinery is going to get stuck. The transcription machinery is going to get stuck. But then it can't happen, and that's why. Exactly. Okay, so it can. When it happens, it it's a happen. mutation, and it's a dead end. It's a Dimers, thymine dimers can also kink the DNA, and that is a particular mutation, typically by 2V, because two thymines together, they can kink with, with, uh, with ultraviolet radiation and form a kink, and that's an actual mutation of the DNA. Uh, the opposite effect, if cytosine pairs with thymine, then the kink is gonna be in, right? Which again is an abnormality on the structure of the DNA, it will send the, the, the train off tracks, if you will. The replication machinery or transcription is not gonna work. On uh, RNA, we got uh, uracil instead of thymine. You notice that it's a single ring and it's mostly the same. You got carbon nitrogen here, you got carbon nitrogen at the bottom, and then two carbons over here, but it's on the radicals. The radicals are the stuff that is peripheral to the ring. Okay, like for example, this, maybe it's a little too small there, right? Hopefully it won't lose resolution too much. Can you see the elements better there? A little bit. See, nitrogen, carbon, oxygen. These that are sticking out of the ring, they're called radicals. Mm -hmm. And it's only at the level of radicals. That is the difference. Uh, between uracil and thymine. So they're very similar molecules. They probably have a common origin. Right? One is on the single strand and the other one is on the double strand. Okay. Also, while I'm talking about single and double strand, I mentioned it before, the single strand, because it is single, you notice the bases are just sticking out, right? It tends to kink and it tends to fold upon itself, form what is known as hair pinning, like the the hairpin like that, okay? So that could have been the origin of DNA from RNA because as it uh, bends up on itself, excuse me, and pairs up, then it stabilizes the molecule, but it also shuts it down. It shuts down the information, okay? So it stabilizes, but also shuts down. So that's why evolutionists talk about an RNA world before a DNA world. This RNA could have been the precursor to the DNA. Okay, let's back out of the cell and uh, out of the nucleus and the molecules and look at the cell again, which is the functional unit, is the cell uh, and the body functioning, right? In mitosis, it's only one split. One cellular split from one cell to two cells, straight up. Before the split, the DNA has to duplicate has to replicate so that each daughter cell ends up with the same amount of DNA as the original parental cell or the original mother cell, all right? And that is what we call the diploid number. Diploid number is the chromosome pairs. Mm -hmm. And again, in any species that we've observed, the, uh, the DNA, typically the chromosomes are in pairs. You think of it as a backup mechanism because sometimes of the pairs, one of the genes in one pair may be recessive genes, and on the other uh, pair is the dominant gene. So there's a safeguard, there's a backup mechanism by having pairs. Mm -hmm. But that also seems to be the universal standard. And therefore, that chromosome pair is what we call diploid. Again, the reference uh, DI, is to two, all right? And it's represented arithmetically as 2n. 2n, n being the number of chromosomes, the single number of chromosomes. So for example, what is n in the human species? 23. And what is 2n? 46. It's just an algebraic expression representing the diploid. Now, every cell in our body is 2N. Every cell in our body is diploid, has 46 or 23 pairs of chromosomes, except the gametes, which are only have, have unpaired chromosomes. So you only have one N or simply N because when the, when the um, 
exponent is a one, uh, sorry, the uh, coefficient is one, it's not shown, right? So just when you see n, it means that the cells are unpaired, those are gonna be gametes. So these are gonna be sex cells. And um, it's called an haploid instead of diploid. I'll cover this in more detail uh, next lecture, but they're called haploids, the H-A meaning single, as opposed to diploid, the I meaning double. All right, so then just a representation here briefly, we're gonna stop at this point. Here's a cell that it just shows the four stages of mitosis, uh, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, uh, going from the cell in interphase that's metabolizing. You see there are no distinct chromosomes, it's just chromatin. And then the cell is going to uh, split. The chromatin becomes chromosomes, distinct segments, and condensed into chromosomes. This cell happens to have how many chromosomes total? four chromosomes, okay? Each chromosome looks like an X, but that's a whole chromosome. So uh, it has four chromosomes or two pairs of chromosomes. So for example, uh, you have to use a little imagination, but uh, there are two small and two large chromosomes. So A and B are pairs and C and D are pairs. You see them lining up here at the equator and then they migrate. This is where the centromere splits and each chromatid, so each leg, each half or each leg of the chromosome is called a chromatid. That's what migrates to the poles so that you end up with the four chromosomes as the original mother cell. What is not shown here is that these would then actually split in half and look like uh, X's. So you would have four chromosomes here and four chromosomes or eight chromatids because it takes two chromatids to form a chromosome. All right, it's probably getting all blurry by now. Don't worry about it. I'm gonna pick up here uh, next lecture and we're gonna look at uh, mitosis and then move into meiosis, which is really our interest is my meiosis because that's the formation of the gametes, all right? And meiosis, one way of looking at it is like a double mitosis double mitosis, and that's why in meiosis we end up with four cells instead of just two, because these two split again and form a total of four, and those are the actual gametes. For each mother cell, we get four gametes from each uh, meiotic division. Okay, I ran out of slides, and you're probably very happy about that, so am I, so we can stop now, <laughs> and um, yes. Okay, Marie, so any questions, comments? Mm. Again, I'm saying that there's more detail than necessary here. I'm just really trying to emphasize the information level, how that information can be held in the chromosomes very well and passed on mechanically. There's an actual mechanism that is a molecular mechanism that is happening right now in our body, in our cells without us having to do anything with it consciously. It's just kind of locked into automatic. It's been like this for millions of years. Billions, actually. All right. All right, great. So it's even under 12. And we actually started a little bit late. So I want to propose to you if, uh, well, I can close the recording now. But uh, stay on, Marie. Don't log off yet, okay? Hold on. Let me just okay. stop everything.